Welcome back to Ascend Legal 101. I'm Ramona and today I'm joined by Trish Machiri, whose dream of aviation has taken her to four continents, numerous countries, and many different roles in airlines, charter operations, aircraft maintenance, quality assurance and safety management, project management, strategic management, and consulting roles. Her next stop is her very own aviation startup called Charterly. Charterly connects private jet owners to the growing number of private jet travelers. I can tell you, I'm just so happy and so thrilled that she's joined us today. She's a woman to watch. And in keeping with our April theme of speaking your truth, she has a lot to say, and she's found the courage to say it. Please help me welcome Trish Machiri. Trish has an extraordinary story, and I noticed her online on LinkedIn when I really noticed she was so visible and she had so much to say. And um, I'm just so thankful, Trish, that you are willing to spend this time with me and, and share uh, with me and our audience today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Ramona. It's an honor and uh, a privilege to be here and uh, to be able to, to tell and share my story. Thank you. So you have this amazing uh, transformation, this amazing sort of um, dream that took you over four continents and sort of hit many as different aspects of aviation, but I'd really like it if you could share with me sort of from the beginning, you know, how did the dream start? Where did it start? How did it progress? Right. So my story, um, I mentioned, uh, I speak a lot about my grandmother's house was um, in the flight path was on the flight path and a lot often when we were playing outside the uh, planes would fly above us and I didn't know anyone who'd flown on a plane and I always wanted to fly on a plane and it was our culture and custom as children when the jets flew across that we would jump in the air and we would wave and we would be shouting again again everybody like all the kids on the street would be doing that and so that was my earliest memory of planes and flying. I just knew that there were machines that flew people from place to place. I had um, relatives who lived abroad. So I knew, yeah, so, you know, those people get to fly on planes. So I found that very interesting. And my interest in aviation actually stemmed from there. Now, when I look back, my interest was actually in travel. But because of my limited knowledge, I thought I needed to work for an airline in order to get to travel. So that's how I started thinking about getting into aviation. And then the most um, obvious thing was if you were flying the plane, then you would get to travel with the plane. So initially I wanted to be a pilot. My grandmother who was a very big part of my um, growing up, my upbringing, she, she she would say to me like i wouldn't be able to sleep at night if i knew you were flying what if something happened and you were on the plane and so she's like no choose another profession and my uncle was like what about maintenance you know so since you're technically minded you'd still be working on planes in the industry and so that was my first introduction to aircraft maintenance i just knew the planes were there and i knew that pilots flew that flew them I didn't know about how they were maintained or that there was all these support people around them. So that was my first kind of um, introduction into the business. And uh, then the next thing was, so how do I get there? So yeah, I just had no idea I knew at the stream. I didn't know how to get there. And it was, I remember speaking with my mom um, after I finished my A-levels and she said to me, so how are you going to do this? So I said, I don't know. And she said, can't you think of something that's a little bit more reasonable? And, and my mom works in HR, and which is very funny because she had no idea how to get me there either. <laughs> so I knew she wanted to help me, but she had no idea how to help me. So just one random day, I saw an advert in the newspaper uh, 
our local airline was recruiting aircraft um, apprentices. And when I looked at that um, advert, I knew it was for me. Mm. And one thing led to another. And I, up until this day, I'm surprised that I made it in because it was such a random stroke of luck that I saw the advert. I happened to see the newspaper. I happened to see that advert. And then through all the hundreds of people who applied, I was, you know, uh, recruited into the into the process. So I'm really grateful for that experience. And that was the foundation of my experience in aviation. So I started off as an aircraft mechanic and I worked for the National Airline. I then moved to the United Kingdom. I moved to do my uh, license. I was looking for greener pastures. So I figured we had one airline in my country and I knew there was like no place for me to go. So I knew the only way was to leave the country. So that's what I did. And um, yeah, so then after that, I studied for a, uh, uh, a master's degree. So I figured early on that I did like planes, but I didn't really want to be fixing planes all my life. So I thought the best thing to do was to kind of broaden my, my knowledge. So I did a transport, air transport management um, master's at City University. So that was another um, pillar on my foundation in the industry because I got to learn about the whole industry. So I kind of took away my scope and my lens from maintenance. And then I started, you know, looking at operations. Uh, ground handling and just the business as a whole. So that kind of, so that was the platform on which I took my career internationally and a um, couple of jobs, countries, continents later, I ended up in Canada and uh, yeah, then I started my company. And so tell me about your company now, because, you know, even the way you describe it, you know, going from airlines, charter operations, aircraft maintenance, quality and safety, project management, strategic management, and now the next is the world of startups and aviation. So it's really exciting. Uh, yes, it's, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I'm always amazed because I think it looks like my career was kind of well structured and kind of well thought of, but a lot of the things happened by accident. <laughs> right. So um, I was working for a charter operator in Toronto and I was actually like in the electronic compartment. And so now I'm like in my 40s and I'm not as agile and as, you know, I can't jump and down, up and down steps like I used to. So I really struggled getting into this bay and coming out. So I was sitting in the bay and I was wondering, how am I going to come out? And so I was like, how long am I going to do this for? You know, like I'm in my 40s, am I going to keep on scrunching myself out in, you know, in little bays and, you know, I enjoy it, but yeah. So, so I was seated there and then I was just looking in the hangar and I was like, but all these aircraft are just seated here. You know, they're all parked here and they fly very few times. They, for the most part, they're in the hangar all the time. And I was like, oh, what if I was able to connect people who want to fly to these aircraft that are parked here a lot? So that's how my idea started. So the basis of my idea was to get a lot of utilization from the jets, from the planes, to get them flying because uh, planes like to fly just like fish like to swim in the water. If you take them out of the water, they don't thrive. Um, so it's the same thing with jets, but people kind of, you know how we are with with things, we kind of like to put them aside and watch them and, you know, but just want keep to keep everything be, safe, keep everything safe, keep it nice and shiny, you know, don't just polish it and wash it and don't use it a lot, but jets like to fly. So the more that you use a plane, the better that it performs. So you save money, uh, you can make money by chartering the plane. And so it made a lot of sense. And so I thought about it and I would talk to my industry colleagues about it and everybody was kind of like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. But I just moved to Canada and I think I was like two years in my uh, newcomer journey and I was like, but I'm new and I'm a black woman and I don't know anyone here and how can I make this happen? And this is, uh, I always liked a Richard Branson's quote that if you are a billionaire, the best way to become a millionaire is to start an airline. So I had no, 
no intention of starting an aviation business because I know how it works. <laughs> so, but this seemed kind of like it looked like it could work and it didn't involve billions or millions of dollars of startup capital. So that's how I started. And I was fortunate. I lived near York University and I was mentored at York University and they helped to bring my idea to birth. So. What a great, and so Charterly is the name of your company. Yes. And you connect private jet owners to people who want to basically charter a jet. That's really yeah. exciting. Yes, and um, so I've been, I've been working on the business for um, like a side hustle. It more or less still is like a side hustle because I haven't really like fully launched because of COVID. So I right. started talking about it openly during COVID because I could see the need um, due to uh, increased safety, increased, um, you know, just the whole um, consciousness around traveling through airports and um so it looked like it was a good time and it all started making sense that you know i think this is actually maybe more than i thought it was um because there i mean there was a time and there's still a time where a lot of airports aren't serviced so the only way to get there is through private jets and you know for other business businesses to continue the only way to do so is through private jets to make maybe sudden random ad hoc journeys. The only way is to do that through private jets. So it sort of started coming together um, during COVID. And yeah, so it's been exciting. It's very challenging because it's different from what I'm used to. I'm used to being in the technical organization. So the business side of things has been very interesting. So you also, part of what you do, um, so the charters you do are both private and cargo. Is that right? right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but you are still really involved in the safety side of aviation. It, can you tell okay. me a little bit about that? Because that is, uh, you know, for some people it's, it's glaringly uh, not present. <laughs> <laughs> for some people, you know, you know, they have a real focus on safety and, and it never really leaves them. Can you tell me about sort of how you are, are sort of continuing that piece of, of your business? Right. Um, so because of my background in aircraft maintenance, so safety is always our main focus. So, you know, we're all about airworthiness and the serviceability and making sure that the aircraft are safe to fly. And over the years, I've, you know, um, so my, uh, my master's degree also had a safety component. So that kind of also roused my consciousness of safety. And in my work, um, so I've done a lot of work in quality and safety. I've noticed that there is a lot of talk about safety, but there's not a lot of commitment. I mean, you know, companies and accountable managers commit to have safety as their number one objective, but then the things that they do tend to say otherwise. So I've realized that the business is very good at saying the right things, um, but then actually doing the right things is is a bit different and on the chartering side um so my focus is i think one of i i attended an accident investigation course with um embry riddle uh, a mooc a couple of years ago and after i said i'm just going to complete this course and i hope i never have to get to deal with accidents and investigations because it's it's intense and um, I've been fortunate I've never been involved in one and I've never worked for a company that's been involved in an accident before. So I'm very grateful for that, but I'm always conscious that um, there's always a potential that something can happen and we need to talk and to make these things um, out there uh, in the open in terms of safety, because it's not enough to just say that we're safety conscious. I think that we also need to um to do things and i think we've also progressed 
a lot over the last few years. I'll say for me, I only started noticing in the last few years that things, some other things that haven't really been talked about around safety are actually really important. For example, racialized people and how they report safety. Uh, minorities and how they view safety. You know, we talk a lot about the dirty dozens, but those put a lot of responsibility on the individual and not on the company and not on the leaders or the managers. So putting the responsibility on a worker to make sure that the safety is adhered to. For me, I think we need a little bit of a shift and for companies and accountable people to to become accountable for those things. Because I was just talking with a colleague a couple of days ago that the dirty dozens, they say that you should be assertive. But if you're a young black girl or a young white boy who's just come out of school and you see a mistake and your boss is this towering big man that you're afraid of, are you going to, does your system and your corporate culture and system give that young man or young lady um, the room and the, do they feel safe? So psychological safety, something that's that we started talking about. So those are the things that for me, I often ask myself, so I'm in the chartering business, so why does it bother me so much? But it bothers me so much because I don't want to charter a jet and then something happens to my passengers on the flight. So I feel responsible for the things that happen on the safety side. So it's not just about um, connecting the people with the jet. So I need to make sure that the operators that we're working with, you know, they have high safety standards, that my customers are going to be safe on every flight that I send them on. Right. I think you raise such an important point. And I, maybe this is a place we can go for a few minutes about inequities and how uh, younger people racialize there's racialized inequities mm -hmm. gender inequities mm -hmm. you know sort of inequities with that with respect to age and um i mean i've been the boss the boss and i've had a young man pat me on the head and say you just write the check and i'm like that's not how it works <laughs> <laughs> right. You need to show me all these things. And I'm then I'm happy to write the check. Yeah. <laughs> right. <Not that> simple. <laughs> so but you know, even um uh do, so a lot of that is where sort of you caught my attention. Because what happens, I think, to a lot of us who are generally, and I'm making a whole bunch of general statements here, mm -hmm. and none of it is going to, you know, hopefully we'll get a lot of comments because I'd like to start this conversation. But generally, if you're from a group that's less advantaged or, um, mm -hmm. you know, you you don't fit the profile of the winner, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? yeah. the white yeah. man of a certain generation right you know all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so if you don't fit that profile i think sometimes um your voice falls on deaf ears but what i'm noticing about you speaking your truth always from a perspective of safety and equality and um you just you're just not afraid to say those things and that is so refreshing i mean it's so it's difficult to find people who are truly sitting in their power i mean you don't have a big like i'm a come out swinging kind of person and you sure. you do not ha have that sort of i guess threatening way oh. about you i mean you're discussing mm -hmm. these issues in a in a really calm mm -hmm. way yeah can you tell me about the process of finding your voice and then finding a place to speak it and speak your truth and yes so yeah so i think i'm referring to accidents a lot so i am generally a very quiet person very mild mind my own business stick to my lane that's and that's what i've done throughout my whole career and you know that's how you survive but 
that's just really who I am. So I'm a person who just likes to mind my own business. So I don't generally do social media. If you go onto my Facebook, you will find maybe two or three posts. If I do post something, I'll delete it after a couple of hours. <laughs> so that's who I am. I don't take pictures. I'm not, you know, I'm, that's not my personality. And when I started um, Charterly, I figured, I sort of need to be out there, but it's not my personality. So how am I going to manage the situation? But I listened to a lot of Gary V when, uh, when the pandemic started and he always used to talk about use your voice and, and speak your truth and uh, find your message. So he kind of got me thinking that it was okay to speak about things. And then, um, then we went through the racialized things going on in the US and people were talking a lot. I read a lot of those conversations and did not really participate. I, yeah, I, that's not my style. So I wouldn't participate. I don't, I wouldn't talk about things that's kind of controversial. So. But anyways, as the conversation started going, I started seeing that nobody was talking about these things in aviation. And I remember um, Googling and searching on Twitter to see aviation companies or aviation people who were talking with an aviation lens about the things that were going on. And I couldn't find anyone who was speaking about those things. So that started bothering me that we were sort of like tone deaf in the industry, like lots of things were going on around us and we just acted like everything was okay. And so um, last year I decided to celebrate Black History Month by posting about uh, the pioneers of aviation. So I would talk about uh, Bessie Coleman and um, that generation of aviators who pioneered uh, flight for, for Black people. And then the following month was Women's Month, and I had interviews with um, famous women. And, and when I did those interviews, it was, um, the conversations were more or less the same about how we couldn't speak. So before we started the interview, we could speak. And then when we, when I started recording, then the conversation kind of, you know, people would become a bit more guarded. So, so then I was, but the takeaways that I had in having those discussions with those women was, it really made me think a lot. So when I published these um, interviews on, on, on my social media, I started getting responses like, don't do it. Um, don't talk about it. Don't rock the boat. Don't, uh, don't go there. So if you want your business to succeed, ignore all those things. So don't offend the powers that be. Don't off offend the people who charter jets. So by talking about these things, you're going to offend rich people who charter jets. So it kind of left me, um, like I didn't know what to do because these things mean a lot for me because they represent who I am. And I thought that these conversations are conversations that we should have in aviation. And then having people that I respected coming and telling me not to talk about them, like I was being silenced. It was, I had a rough time. I actually went through a lot of like trauma counseling. I talked to a lot of people and it brought a lot of trauma that I had experienced in the industry over a lot of years that I'd never talked about. And so I was silent for almost for, for the most of last year. And I, I actually stepped a little bit away from my business. I just did the needful. And I was really thinking about how to progress. Did, did I really want to have a business that didn't want me to be me? You know, did I want to operate in an industry where I have to be somebody else to operate in this industry? So those were the questions that I was struggling with. And I went back to work last year uh, on the floor and I was working on some big Hercules. And uh, yeah, another funny accident happened. This time it was a real accident and I broke my leg. <laughs> and then I was sitting on my couch. Uh, I couldn't walk, I was on crutches. And then I started thinking and I was like, so I'm here, I can't work. I can't do my business. I can't talk, I can't do anything. So like, what's next? 
And then these messages just kept on coming into my mind and I started writing and I was talking to my friends about how my creativity, I like to write. I like to write, I like to read, but throughout all these things, I was finding I couldn't write. I think because I was restricted, my voice was restricted. But when I broke my leg, like I just had this inspiration, I started writing. And so that's how I started writing. And then I wrote a post about aircraft maintenance that seems to have struck a chord with a lot of people. And I had like, yeah, that was, a, I think that was the turning point for me that, um, People within the maintenance, maintenance organization have all these challenges that they can't talk about. When they do talk about, they're not being heard. So then I, I was started seeing diversity from lots of different angles that um, inequality, like there was inequality just in the whole business model. So mechanics feel that they are disenfranchised compared to other parts of the business. So it wasn't just a racial gender age thing it was also you know i've talked to flight attendants who feel like there's no room for them to grow because they're not licensed in anything okay they are licensed in um in uh, being a cabin attendant but you know for most of the jobs you either need to be a mechanic or a pilot to progress so that's how i started speaking i think i i have two sort of comments or uh, things that really struck me in what you just said. The first is that I think a lot of the really negative feedback you were receiving was also from people who were presupposing that those rich people were all old rich white men, <laughs> right? The only people who charter jets are, <laughs> right? And that they're going to be offended as well. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and, you know, you're sort of, um, you know, anyway, um, but it, I, in addition to that, um, it, it's really interesting how you identified other places in the organization where there was inequality, because I have experienced that as well, not just, I mean, mm -hmm. I realized sort of as the accountable executive of an organization mm -hmm. that the flight, uh, the flight crew the flight ops yeah. side saw the maintenance side not as a partner but as a pain in the ass because yeah. you know if they didn't get done what they needed done then nobody could fly and the maintenance department thought the pilots were all pretty boys who needed to like stop complaining and do you know what i mean like it there was I this do. sort of you nailed it yeah so um and it and it there was no, I, I, and I didn't understand. I didn't, I didn't understand the disconnect until later on, somebody was sort of complaining to me about something. And I was like, yeah, but you don't understand if the maintenance department isn't working and isn't, mm -hmm. you know, up to snuff, of course, we're paying a lot of attention there because without them, nobody in this building has a job. Mm -hmm. Like we have to yeah. make sure that's working because that feeds everybody's kids in the whole place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I was, I guess, probably um, purposefully unwilling to see the, the disconnect or the inequality that was felt within the organization because I was looking at other things, right? And maybe that's where we as leaders, mm -hmm. um, you know, need to yeah. focus and thank God you are talking about these things now. Someone has to. Yeah, someone has to. And um, I think a lot of people are starting to talk about it. And what I found is people generally talk behind closed doors. And by doing that, nothing has been changing. And I've been finding like the prescriptions that people have are the same as what we've done for the last 30, 40 years. And without a lot of, you know, positive results, but we want to keep on doing the same thing because that's what brings us the most comfort. So I was fortunate. I, I, I'm, I find, I think I'm privileged, you know, to be able to have these conversations because, um, I've been there, done that, you know, so I, I'm, 
I could go and work in tech. You know, I could, I don't know, go and just, you know, I don't know, work in a clerical job because, you know, I, I've had my adventures, but I think it's important that we start building an industry that works for the next generation. You know, we need to change the culture. So the culture really needs to shift. And I think it's a global thing and it's happening in every industry, but I think a lot more industries are more involved um than aviation is but i will say that i did notice that this year things are uh, companies i think are maybe talking a bit more and and i think over the last few days i've noticed i think if it's not about three or four airlines that have appointed female ceos mm. so the talking works and shining the light works on these problems but if we just talk behind close doors and complain and do nothing, then nothing's going to change. Do you think that, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you to sort of have look in your crystal ball, but do you think that um, as some of the old ways age out of our industry, mm -hmm. that because younger people now are raised like it, it to be much more open and to talk about things and to be aware of mm -hmm. of inequity or be aware of really everything i mean even talking to my kids i'm <laughs> half the time i'm like i haven't had my coffee yet <laughs> i don't know what to say right <laughs> because they're thinking about things that i just didn't even mm -hmm. wrap my head around until i was probably 35. yeah so um, do you think that that the shift you're seeing is something that we will see continue? Yes, yeah, so I'm hoping. So I'm not sure what we're seeing, whether it's real or not, or whether it's just a smoke screen. Right. So if it's real, then I think we're on to something good. Um, but I have a lot of faith in in the younger generation, because like you're saying, their thinking is different. I think that as an industry, we need to create a culture and environment that um, that's inviting for them to come in. Because I see, for me, what I see as being our next challenge is um, attracting them to come into aviation careers. Because they can see, you know, they don't want to have to deal with that. They want to go to work for equitable employers. They don't want to go there and do the work. You know, they want the right. work to be done. So we should do the work so that they can come and work and not have to do the work that we were supposed to do. So I think um, that we need to really work on the culture so that we attract and retain. So I think there's a lot of focus on attracting pilot training and stuff like that, but we're not changing the culture. So why aren't we attracting people? Because I've looked at it and I've been like, going to medical school is maybe more expensive than becoming a pilot. But we've got no shortage of diverse doctors. So I don't think it's a funding issue. It's not about money, but it could be maybe a representation issue. I don't know. Um, but how have other industries attracted people? And how are they managing to retain? I know no industry is perfect, but some industries are doing better than we are. So we should maybe also look at how other industries have positioned themselves so that they can attract that talent. Because if we don't get the talent right, and if people don't feel comfortable and represented and included, uh, and if they don't feel like they belong, then they're not going to come. Oh, if they come, they won't stay. And I think I was reading statistics about how a great percentage of people who come into like the maintenance training leave before they finish the training. So how do we get them to complete the training and then stay in the industry? Because people complete the training, then they go work on trains. Right. So. Right. <laughs> I th actually, I have another question about that area, and then I'd like to move to ask you about CEO. But mm -hmm. the but you just brought up a good point, and 
Um, what about, I think there's a bit, little bit of a bias. I don't know if you've seen it. And I guess my question really is, have you seen this? When I see people who are uh, military aircraft technicians um, moving into the private sector, I think the private sector wants to scoop these people up because they have so many hours, you know, yeah. doing the work. But it seems to me the regulatory side of things or how we do what license people um, is a little bit broken because there's number one, uh, a, an idea that these people aren't licensed and who do they think they are and there's a sense of entitlement for coming out of the military and going into private practice or private industry when in fact there is not a sense of entitlement I think it's just like hey I'm out of the military and I need a job now doing what I've always yeah. done <laughs> but so um, is there sort of is the process to move from uh, being a technician or a mechanic to a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer, is, is that process too onerous or too uh, burdened with, do you know what I mean? Or is it perhaps a bias? Because I have seen regulators, like regulators mm -hmm. have said to me, like straight out, well, he's from the military and he thinks, and I'm like, I don't think he thinks that. <laughs> like, right? I think that's about you. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, that's, the, that's right in my, um, that's right up my alley, right? Because <laughs> I've um, experienced the same kind of um, bias because I'm foreign trained. Right. And so it's, if you haven't gone through the conventional system, uh, especially in Canada, if you haven't gone through the conventional Canadian system of going to uh, the approved colleges and getting the approved training, then it's an uphill struggle. And that's one of my posts that got me thinking because that also brought a lot of conversations because, um, so I'll say that it's the same if you're coming from the military or if you're coming from Emirates, if you're coming from British Airways, if you're not, if you haven't gone through the Canadian training, um, approved training and approved licensing training, then you just have an, uh, an uphill struggle. It's not uphill as in terms of if you do it the way that they want to, you can do it, you know, but I don't think there should be a reason to. For example, like I'm foreign trained. I... I did two years of full-time study with two week breaks in the middle. We didn't have summer breaks, no spring breaks, no nothing break. It was continuous learning. That's how we do it in Africa. <laughs> and, um, and then when I came here, so our process, I think it's the same for the military. You submit your qualifications and then the regulator um, um, reviews your training, like your syllabus according uh, with their, against their syllabus. So in my case, we have a language barrier. And it's very interesting because the language barrier is like British English and Canadian English. So that created so many problems for me until they said that my qualification wasn't, wasn't I needed to retrain, literally. So after working for years and years and years, someone can work for British Airways for 50 years, be licensed, be EASA licensed, and then they can come here and then be told that they have to go back to school. It's the same thing for a military guy. You know, they've been working for 30 years and they come out of the military very experienced, but they have to retrain. But what's really interesting, but I, maybe I won't go through this, but maybe I should. <laughs> because it's really funny. I don't understand. I'm a newcomer, so forgive me. I'm, not um being rude or anything i just there's some canadian things are very interesting and some the nuances are very interesting so i did this two years because program. i'm canadian i'm interested to know what that what the differences <laughs> are so you go yeah, so right the ahead. outside view the outside view this is how we see it um so my training i think was like i don't remember what the number of hours are required by uh, transport canada for for the training but my hours were almost double the training 
but when I submitted my qualifications, they said it wasn't good enough. So I had some areas with differences that I think would have been fair to just say, okay, Trish, take this course or, you know, take this exam or something like that. But they said I should do it all over again. So there's a course. I like this course because it's given me the opportunity to get licensed in Canada. But I did this course in one month. But now I'm good enough. It gave me the, I did the whole aircraft maintenance course in one month. Wow. So someone could do a whole aircraft maintenance course in one month, find somewhere to do an apprenticeship, and that would be good. But somebody who's done double the hours, because it wasn't in Canada, will be dismissed. So my boss, one of my bosses, he was ex-military. So when I was starting the, the process, so he said, Trish, don't bother to argue with Transport Canada. Just go do the course. It took me two weeks to do it. Isn't that a slap in the face that you can do a course for two weeks and then become approved? Yeah. That's the part that I didn't understand. Had they said go back to school for two years? I just said that's fair. But go do a course for two weeks and then it's okay. How does that make sense? <laughs> right. Right. But, I'm keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> but I like that course because it allows foreign people to get licensed. Right. Of course. <laughs> Of course. And uh, I suppose every country has the hoops that you have to jump through. I just find it really interesting coming from a, from sort of private industry and then going into that that world and mm -hmm. and working within sort of a framework that is antiquated in some ways and also yeah. very bureaucratic who yeah. in who you know the people who sometimes are making the rules don't actually work in the yeah. industry so it, it can sometimes uh it's yeah. like the they're speaking different languages you know it's like yeah. and yeah. I have a friend who is a regulator but he's a he's a just a excellent person and great pilot and he said to mm -hmm. me well sometimes people don't listen until there's a gaping hole in the ground with smoke coming out of it but you yeah. never want it to get there, right? No, you don't. And, and, and yeah, you don't. And I think, you know, with the crisis that's looming, like for, and I think it's the same thing for pilots as well, for foreign trained pilots. So there's a looming shortage coming. And right now there is a competition for skilled people. So Canada is becoming very uncompetitive because of these barriers to entry. So with a lot of countries, um, you can start the processing and the licensing process and do the test before you arrive. And there's no need to retrain. You just write the exams and then you're good to go. So some of these barriers in the long term, I think, um, I believe that Transport Canada is working on it. Um, but these are things that we really need to look so that you know, we've got great talent who've worked with international experience. We should embrace these people because they bring more um, to the Canadian environment. And, and and people are not only looking at coming to Canada. So for the EASA license, you know, uh, in the UAE, you can get the EASA license while you're there. So some licenses allow you to do it even in your home country, whereas in Canada, you literally have to be here and then you have to jump all sorts of hoops so i think to remain competitive you know these are things that and that's the um inclusivity part of it as well so so yeah so you're right so the military is another area that's yeah not included a lot mm -hmm. perhaps it's just all outsiders Maybe. Which is interesting because yeah. the, the one of the things that I love about aviation is in, in my experience is that once you're in, you're in and it's and it's so it's I mean, we it. yeah, and we really yeah. embrace our people and protective are protective of them. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I loved being embraced by a community mm -hmm. and um, and connecting with everybody seems open to yeah. connect, you know, yeah. but yeah. It's, um, I, I think we're on the right path in Canada. 
um, but it's just um, growing pains. I think maybe there hasn't been a need before to really look at these things, yes. you know, so mm -hmm. maybe there wasn't a lot of aircraft mechanics coming because I think maybe when the pipeline increases, then things will change. Also, you know, when a lot of people start um, interacting with the Canadian system, then Transport Canada has got no choice but to to change. So I think that things are on the right path and um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just interesting. <laughs> it really the is. Yeah. It really is. Well, I don't want to take up a ton of your time, but I, um, I just, I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to talk to me. And I know, you know, it can be a bit disconcerting when somebody out of the blue is in touch with you. But I do have to say, it was just so inspiring to me to sort of read what you're putting out into the world and watching people interact with that. Uh, and it, not always in a positive way, but even the way mm -hmm. you were sort of handling those kind of mm -hmm. comments or, or that discussion was really inspiring to me. And, you know, you're the real deal. Like I am, I have to say, like I'm turning 51 this month. I'm going to say it every chance I get. It's my birthday month. It's my birthday oh, month. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so my birthday month. Um, <laughs> so I'm turning 51 and I'm sort of in this sort of funny, stuck in between generation, generation X, where, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have these real pioneers on one side of us, certainly the women around me, you know, who came before me, real pioneers, real sort of mm -hmm. having to do work. And this, I mean, I can't wait, actually, later in the month, I'm going to talk to a couple of my friends who are retired judges, and the stories they have are ridiculous to me. And they would be ridiculous to you. But it's just, you know, the difference in generations. Yeah. And then there's me. And then there's and I sort of feel like I still got to like knock the doors down and, you know, mm. I have to be sort of tough. Like there's yeah. this sort of real delicate balance between toughness mm. and having to be a hard line about things and trying to still mm. find my yeah. feminine sort of nature. And then there's your generation where you talk about stuff. I find women in their 40s just are so cool to me. I am just the the things that you are not afraid to talk about is yeah. mind blowing. So and it, I mean you talk about it with enough experience not to be mm -hmm. sort of like oh she's 20 she'll figure it out. Yeah. Right? You talk about yeah. it with enough experience but still have such wisdom. And um you're just a living example of someone who has stepped into that sort of into yourself and you've gotten brave enough to speak your truth and and you know I really appreciate your time you're really doing it in my house we would say you're really and truly you're really and oh. truly doing it <laughs> so thank you thank you it's such an honor and privilege and um so grateful for the work that you do and um you know for for the platform to be able to share the story and I share so that other people can have the bravery. Um, I know not everybody has the um, can share and talk openly, but for those who can, you know, I say, you know, step into it and do it, like you guys say. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, now, where can we find you? I'm sorry to interrupt. No problem. So you can find me. I'm on all socials. Um, Trish Matiri on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, LinkedIn's probably the best place. And um, yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the best place. I am on um, Instagram and Facebook as well. And um, yeah, I, if anyone needs my email, I can give it via e uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, yeah. you know, I found you through LinkedIn. I saw you were really visible to me on LinkedIn and, and, um, d you know, that's a good spot too, because the level of conversation is up leveled. I find anyway, you don't get a lot of nonsense conversation on LinkedIn or I, d I don't see it. Mm -hmm. anyway. 
Where yeah, it's a, it's a great place and I think we need we need these kind of conversations and thank you so much for, for the work that you're doing and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.